Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue the discussion on cavity filters by looking at some calculation tools and also building and testing some practical examples. I will first confirm the exact behaviors that are to be expected and continue with measuring some actual use cases. So one of the things that the simulation predicts based on the simplified LC models is that the loop or tap coupled resonators will have an impedance peak first followed by an impedance minimum, whereas the capacitively coupled resonators will be the other way around. So first the impedance dip and then the peak. Now in real life, you will end up needing both types of behavior. This is similar to how you have upper sideband and lower sideband filters with crystals. However, with a cavity filter, this property finds a special use case in something like a repeater that has a relatively small frequency shift or translation usually in the order of just a few megahertz. Now, before testing a cavity filter, you need to build one or buy it. I personally found that building these is quite interesting and rewarding. So the first thing to keep in mind is that a cavity filter conducts current both in the central resonator and in the outer walls. So the filter should be built from a good electrical conductor, especially the central resonator since here the perimeter that conducts the current is smaller than in the outer walls. Now, other than this, you also need to take care with the interconnections between the various pieces so that all of these are as low loss as possible as well. Common building materials include copper and aluminum. Now, regarding the dimensions, these are easiest to be calculated by a combination of calculation tools and experimentation. But an important thing to remember especially for real life use cases, is that the exact filter frequency is physical shape dependent. The major contributor here is the length of the central resonator. And while the physical shape is highly temperature dependent. So if your resonator cavity experiences large temperature variations, the central frequency will end up varying. You can either take this into account and just make a wider bandwidth filter, or use special materials with low thermal expansion coefficients. Here, a material called INVAR stands out, since this has a far lower thermal expansion coefficient compared to copper and aluminum. And even if its conductivity isn't all that great, it's still a widely used material in the construction of resonant cavity filters. For my builds, however, I will be using copper in the shape of either wire, tubes or pipes, and pieces of PCB. It might not be an ideal solution, but it's easy to work with and quite easily available. Also, since it can be soldered together, it makes the construction quite painless. So after you have the dimensions and you cut up the pieces, I found that it's quite useful to put a bit of solder on all the places that you will end up later interconnecting. This needs a bit of flux or resin beforehand. So just to make the solder stick easier. And while all of this flux, also needs to be cleaned afterwards. Now, once all of the pieces have been prepared, they can now be easily interconnected. Now, the other thing that I found useful was to add a hole in the plate in which the resonator finally sits. So this will make lining it far easier. And well, the final thing to mention is that with most cavity filters, the resonance frequency and response is adjustable, usually by some sort of conductor that comes in from the other end of the cavity. Here, I found that zinc plated nuts can easily be soldered and screws can be used for the actual adjustment. Now, the conductivity of zinc and iron is not all that great compared to the rest of the copper, but this sort of system does work. So here I have the first filter to analyze today. It's a single resonator cavity, which even though has two ports, it's intended to be used as a single port device. All the side pieces are pieces of two-sided PCB, which are all soldered together, and the central resonator is a piece of pipe. And well, the door is again a piece of PCB, which to ensure good all-round contact, I added a set of copper tapes soldered to both sides, and also the same thing was done to the box. So here on the sides, I also have this copper tape. Now, the key knight among you may have already noticed that this particular cavity is rectangular. It's not really round. 
This is not really ideal, a cylinder would be far better, but a rectangular cavity works, and well, when it's built from pieces of PCB, it's far more practical. Anyway, looking on the inside, the coupling is done through a pair of SMA connectors, one of which has a T shape for capacitive coupling, so there's no direct connection to the central resonator, just a bit of capacitance in between the structure and the resonator, and while the other port has a loop which is connected back to the same side. Here, the exact connection point, if it's to the side or bottom, is not all that important. Lastly, this resonator is just for demonstration. So there is no tuning screw added on the top side. So finally, let's see how this thing actually works. For this experiment, I just connected one port of the device to the light VNA, and while the other port was left open. In this way, I tested each of the ports. So starting off with the magnetically coupled port, so the loop coupled one, we get more or less the same behavior as expected from the simulation. We get an impedance peak, followed by an impedance dip, somewhere in the 800 MHz region. So nothing really special here. Now, when I move to the capacitively coupled port, well, here I got a bit of a problem. In my first measurement, I first got a impedance peak, followed by an impedance dip. So not really what we were supposed to be getting. And well, other than the fundamental resonances, I also saw the same thing occurring at a frequency multiple. Now, as an observation, the capacitive coupling was done using a T-shaped electrode. So here the central wire from the SMA connector was connected into the middle of a piece of wire. Now, when I changed this, so I connected it to the end of the piece of wire, well, the response also changed. So by doing this modification, I got the response that was expected from the simulations. A impedance dip followed by an impedance peak. And while the secondary resonance shows the same thing. So even though the inductively coupled resonator does correspond more or less to the LC equivalent circuit, the capacitive coupling is a bit more difficult. But anyway, what the basic LC model cannot reproduce is the wider band response. Now, if you recall, the cavity resonator does behave like a quarter wavelength transmission line. And while the quarter wavelength has multiple resonances occurring at odd frequencies, this is more visible with the inductively coupled port. So other than the fundamental resonance at 800 megahertz, I got a very clear resonance at three times this frequency. So at around 2.5 gigahertz. Now, there probably was an extra resonance occurring at an even higher frequency, but this was not visible because of the various noises appearing. So anyway, this is a very important property of cavity resonators to keep in mind, since you might not want these extra resonances occurring. Since here, the signal can pass through. So you might need to do some extra measures to prevent that. Now, the second filter that I want to measure today is a multi-resonator interdigital filter. This is built in more or less the same way as the previous one, a box made from pieces of PCB with SMA connectors on the side and internal pipe resonators. But here, I also added in some adjusting screws to fine tune the filter's response. Finally, to keep the box well closed, I also added in these spacers on the side into which the lid can be placed. So this side up and using these nuts, it can all be tied up together. Now, a small detail to mention here is that the box itself is not perfectly flat. I couldn't be bothered to sand it down properly. So to get everything into nice electrical contact, I also did in this piece of paper onto which the final plastic lid is added. And well, when everything is screwed in together, then you get almost no gap in between the copper VCB and the copper lid. So with the paper, there is more or less a uniform pressure spread out all over the copper plate. Now with this filter, I actually had a target sensor frequency of 1.42 gigahertz. The intention is to use it at some point for a radio astronomy experiment. But anyway, to calculate the dimensions, I used this online tool 
in which you can insert some values, like the center frequency, the bandwidth of the filter, the resonator count, passband ripple, depending on the type of response you want, interfacing impedances, and well, certain dimensions. And well, once you hit calculate, you get the expected response, and well, certain dimensions from which you can actually build the device. So this is how I determine the practical filter size. Alternatively, I found this other website where they have multiple articles and design files. So here you have an article on the principles of cavity resonators, as well as a spreadsheet to calculate them. And while the nice thing about this spreadsheet is that it provides calculations for interdigital filters, as well as for comb line filters. So regardless of the exact calculation method, just keep in mind that there is a high chance that you will have to make some sort of adjustments, mainly because of the difficulty to build exactly what was simulated, and at the same time, because most of the calculations do take some degree of assumptions. Anyway, I also measured this filter as well, so this is connected to both ports of the measurement equipment, and after quite a bit of fine tuning, the filter does indeed have a center frequency of 1.42 GHz, and the minus 3 decibel bandwidth is about 48 MHz. Now, looking at the slopes of the filter, these are quite steep, so we have a very clear drop off, and the passband does have a bit of a ripple. So, since we have three resonators, we very clearly see three peaks appearing. Now, even so, if we check the maximum attenuation that is occurring during these peaks and valleys, we can see that we have a maximum attenuation of only minus 1.5 decibels, which is not that bad for a pomade filter. But just keep in mind that with any filter, the higher the order of the filter, in this case the resonator count, the more loss you will inevitably get in the passband. So all in all, this is quite a usable filter. And hopefully, not too soon in the future, I will be able to put it to some good use. The next filter to look at today is a 2 resonator helical filter, which I've built for the 2 meter or 144 MHz ham band. So the main special feature here is the shape of the resonators. These are not straight rods, but rather they are made in the form of a helix from a piece of copper wire. In general, this will make the filter far smaller, so a normal straight rod cavity filter would be in the range of 40 to 50 centimeters whereas this thing is less than 6 centimeters. So size is a major benefit with this sort of filter. But the downside of course will be the extra losses that this will present. Now from a construction point of view, this is built in the same way as the previous filters. So SMA connectors, copper PCB, a lid with a piece of plastic to close it up really nicely. And well the only difference is that I try to add in these nuts on the corners, to try and screw everything in. Now these aren't connected all that well, so maybe this isn't the best way of doing things. And of course, we also have the tuning screws on the upper side. So to calculate this last type of filter, I use this online helical resonator bandpass filter calculation tool. So this is based on the work of A.I. Zverev from the book Handbook of Filter Synthesis, and well, there's some more details if you want to read about how the filter is being calculated. But anyway, you have a graphical representation of how the filter is supposed to look, what are the various dimensions, and well, once you input your filter parameters, like center frequency, bandwidth, loss in the passband, and well, input and output impedance, you can hit calculate, and you will get the various dimensions that are needed to actually build the filter. And well, if you want to make various adjustments, one of the things that you can play around with is the helix diameter. So if you want to make it bigger or smaller, this will impact the various other values. So then I also connected this filter to the light VNA, so to both ports, to start measuring it and observing the response. So with this, we are getting a very nice response. So the center frequency and the 10 megahertz bandwidth are more or less the same as was expected from the data that was input into the filter calculator. But anyway, looking specifically into the passband, 
even though we can see that this filter is working at about a tenth of the frequency of the previous filter, and it has fewer resonators, so only two, we are still getting similar values of attenuation. So the maximum insertion loss in the passband is only about minus 1.1 decibels. So considering this is a helical resonator filter, this is quite a good result for this type of structure. Now, one misconception is that cavity filters need to be large constructions. Well, wavelength proportional large anyway. Now, this is true with the straight resonator filters, of course, but size can be reduced with the helical resonator. A few commercial helical filters do exist, but as an amateur, how small can you realistically make these? Well, my most ambitious filter so far is this thing. It's a triple resonator helical filter that has the resonators built on 3D printed 1.5 cm diameter supports, and the whole thing is mounted on a PCB. So this is part of a more complex project, but the filter itself is built using a set of clips, commonly used for EMI shields, and while the rest of the resonator box is built from some thin pieces of PCB with screws on the top ends for fine tuning. So since this was built by hand, it's all crooked, but the two pieces, once you align them properly, do fit together quite nicely. Anyway, this whole thing is about 2.6 by 2 by 6 centimeters big. And for me, this filter is small enough. So finally, I got a chance to measure this filter. Again, I connected it to both ports of the light VNA. And if we look at the measurement result, we can observe that the passband attenuation is much higher than for the previous filters. So somewhere in the minus 4.5 decibel range. But the transition slope, so between the pass and stop band, is also much higher. So the third resonator is providing quite a clear benefit from this point of view at least. Now, with this particular filter, the losses were increased for a number of reasons. First of all, the contact between the two pieces of the resonator, so this shielding case and the PCB is not all that great. These clips aren't the best conductors. A continuous soldering would have been much better. Also, the resonators are built with quite thin wire. The thinner the resonator wire, the more loss you will get. And also, three resonators will have more loss than two. However, this should still be a good filter for signal processing applications. In the end, cavity resonators are quite an interesting building challenge, but they also result in quite good filters. Considering they can be built with relatively low losses, the power handling capability will also be quite good. It's not uncommon to have such filters capable of supporting 100 or even more watts of RF power. And well, with that said, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.